Philopate. Philopate always has something smart or witty or mischievous to say when I introduce him, as I have done for many years. Once he stepped to the lectern and shared with the audience in this room his regret that I felt it necessary to come up with something new to say about him each year. Why couldn't we all just agree that from then on it would be quite all right for poor old Bob to deliver the same introduction year after year? After all, no one would remember what I'd said the year before, which seemed to me on the one hand true, <laughs> but on the other hand, not a sufficient reason to deny myself the pleasure of saying something almost new. Another year, I thought I had outdone myself, managing to introduce Phil by way of an extended comparison with his hero, Montaigne. Not exactly peas in a pod, these two writers of personal essays, but near enough in their respective eccentricities and their indifference to conventional decorums to compare as if they belong together. A very high compliment, I thought to my friend Phil, who deserves such compliments. But still, as I say, a very high compliment. Fully elaborated, substantiated in my introduction, at the end of which Phil took the microphone and said, well, that seems about right. <laughs> <laughs> and waited expertly for the laughter to stop before going on. Is Phil Lopate an essentially comic writer? Does the fact that he often makes us laugh tell us how to answer that question? As with so many such questions, everything depends on what you mean by the word essentially. Phil can do many things. He tells great stories, pungent anecdotes. He is enthralled with the play of ideas and knows how to dramatize his own encounter with challenging theories and notions. He is very much a creature of his moment, fascinated with manners and trends and attitudes. But Phil is also something of an esthete, moved to the very root of his being by great poems and great films and artworks hung in great museums, by no means disdainful of what used to be called popular culture, he is also an unapologetic, unembarrassed celebrant of the high, the rare, and the difficult. Occasionally brash or whimsical in his essays, he can also be intensely serious or vulnerable, though I've ne never known him, not even once, to succumb to what Saul Bellow used to call low seriousness. And so again I ask, why not? Is Phil essentially a comic writer? He is that. And more than that, can a comic writer also be some of the time dark? Of course he can. Can he impart ideas, insight, information? Can he argue a case, correct a misinterpretation, tell us what we would do well to like or to love? Of course he can. And so, to hell with my question, better to end for the moment with the thought that, as he himself said, about Montaigne, quote, what is unique about Phil is the great mental freedom he exhibits in everything he writes. Maybe that doesn't sound like much, but great mental freedom, quite a lot. Add to that boldness, wit, and the complete absence of Kant. And there you have Phil Lopate. Thank you for that very moving introduction, and I don't have anything witty to say about it, but I accept it gratefully. And, um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that delightful reading. Um, I'm going to read a, a piece I wrote fairly recently uh, about a filmmaker, uh, Dushan Makaveyev, and it's called Dushan Makaveyev, The Wolf and the Teddy Bear. 
The second time I met Dushan Makarev, the first time was as a journalist interviewing him about W.R., The Mysteries of the Organism, occurred at the Telluride Film Festival and that old mining and now ski resort condo mountain area of Colorado. I was there largely as a friend of the festival's organizer, Tom Luddy, while Makaveev had come with his new film, Sweet Movie. Tom Luddy is a human switchboard who connects people he thinks might want to know each other. And in the case of Dushan and me, we hit it off immediately. I like to think it was because we both have a sardonic, impious sense of humor. Someone with a mischievous sensibility can only be reassured by meeting a fellow mocker, willing to look at any subject from an irreverent, contrarian angle. As we came to discover, our sensibilities were fairly different, but there was enough common glue for us to begin a friendship in the midst of that preening, vainglorious environment, which is a film festival. The three honorees that first year at Telluride, 1974, were Francis Ford Coppola, Gloria Swanson, and Lenny Riefenstahl, and the presence of the last provoked controversy. There were even pickets, if I recall. Susan Sontag's great essay written that same year, Fasc Fascinating Fascism, was in part an angry response to Riefenstahl's tribute at Telluride. Sontag wrote, the purification of Lenny Riefenstahl's reputation of its Nazi dross has been gathering momentum for some time, but it, has, but it has reached some kind of climax this year with Riefenstahl, the guest of honor in the new cinephile controlled festival held in the summer at Colorado. End quote. I remember going up in an elevator with Riefenstahl and Gloria Swanson and the two ancient honorees exchanging health secrets. Swanson recommended sunflower seeds. <laughs> Outrage is my short suit, so I could never muster umbrage at the presence of Riefenstahl. Not that I wanted to cozy up to her, either. Her kind had baked my kind. What intrigued me, and Dushan, more, was a beautiful print of The Blue Light, a silent film which starred the young Lenny in her acting days scampering up the mountainside in a short, ragged dress. It was the finest example of the German mountaineering genre, pre-Hitler, <laughs> that celebrated the healthy body in nature. Julie Christie, who was present at Telluride just because she liked seeing interesting movies, had also been taken with The Blue Light and even lovelier had become friendly with both Dushan and me in the easy, casual way that such an intimate festival made possible. I later came to appreciate that Telluride was not quite as democratic as I'd imagined. The simple truth was that I was in the in-group for a change as a friend of Luddy and so got to hang out with the celebrities while the hoi polloi looked on with no hope of making the acquaintance of Miss Christie, Francis Ford, Coppola, et al. Probably it was Dushan, with his enthusiasm for improbable schemes, who came up with the idea of shooting a remake of The Blue Light then and there, with himself directing, Julie playing the mountain girl, and I writing the script. We even went so far as to hike around the mountains looking for locations. Julie, ever the good sport, posed against various rock formations, <laughs> while Dushan and I snapped photographs. By that time, he was an internationally renowned filmmaker and she a major star. But what was I doing there? <laughs> I had written a book of poetry and begun a memoir about my teaching kids. At this point, I was nowhere in their league. Before I could start to worry myself sick about how I would pull together a script in two days so we could start shooting once the festival had ended, <laughs> reality intruded. Where in the vicinity were we going to get professional camera and sound equipment, much less a budget for even the cheapest production? Had we gone through with the film, it probably would have had a campy home movie charm. No great loss. What strikes me today is how unconcerned Dushan was about the source material with its secondhand Nazi taint. Perhaps he was so secure in his progressive views and had moreover encountered so much bullshit from the left and the right in his Eastern European experience that Riefenstahl was just another piece of 20th century history, 
which fascinated him in Toto. If anything, he could always be galvanized by the contradictory pulls of purity and violence, righteous ideology and scandal. At the time we became friends, I was 31 years old and Makaveya 42, 11 years older. I have the habit of seeking out friendships with older people who offer a glimpse of the road ahead and then trying to show them that I can keep up, be as old, as knowledgeable about their cultural references. <laughs> Ironically, Makaveya was much more receptive to youth culture than I. Perhaps he mistook me for a young person instead of the prematurely middle-aged possessor of an old soul I thought myself to be. <laughs> Makaveyev had a way of speaking in short verbal spurts that came out like a dog's bark. He always sounded hoarse. His favorite word was incredible. <laughs> he seemed ever on the lookout for the bizarre, and he would get as enthusiastic about the awful as the sublime. In Telluride, his main enthusiasm was for his Yugoslav countryman, Nikola Tesla, the inventor of the alternate current, who had once inhabited these mountains and about whom Makaveyev considered doing a movie. He hoped by remaking the blue light somehow to tie in Tesla, who, Makaveyev would write in a later essay, claimed in the moments of heightened creativity he was radiating a blue light. This essay was called Nikola Tesla Radiated a Blue Light. Wilhelm Reich, too, had a blue light fixation, Makaveyev pointed out in the same essay, writing, Already back in 1934, Reich explained to Eric Erikson that all living creatures radiate a blue light. <laughs> Erikson did not believe him. Reich invited Erikson, it was in Denmark, during the summer vacation, to observe with him couples making love on the beach in darkness. <laughs> he asserted that the blue radiation, which becomes more intense during the sexual act, can be observed by naked eye. <laughs> Since then, Erikson considered Reich mad. <laughs> All these blue light convergences were just the sort of thing to get Makaveyev's imagination spinning. Did he himself believe? I sure didn't. I was on Erikson's side. <laughs> that there was any truth to this theory of blue light, creativity, and sex? Hard to say. There was a refreshingly amoral suspension of disbelief to his enthusiasms. At the very least, a reluctance to make the usual, usual condemning judgments. He preferred to exhibit a baffled wonderment. Incredible. <laughs> I realized to some degree his abrupt speech patterns and reliance on certain adjectives may have had to do with English not being his first language. He would skip definite articles, as many foreign speakers do. Makaveyev had a tolerant manner which was, like every enthusiast I've known, inflected by sudden impatience. For instance, if he wanted to talk when you were talking, and what you were saying bored him, he would start to close one eye. <laughs> then when you were done, he would take up from where he last left off, making grunting, okay, to signal this continuation. With his bald head, beard, and avid, alert eyes, he kept reminding me of a wolf. There was something vulpine, too, about his powerful, hulking build, though he neutralized that physically intimidating quality around women, making himself into more of a huggable teddy bear. Speaking of wolves, my first encounter with Makaveyev <laughs> was, as I mentioned, when my friend Bill Zavatsky and I interviewed him for the New York Herald, now defunct. He was explaining to us the principles of montage he used in a sequence of W.R. He said, I edit it normally without Stalin. Then I put Stalin in at the moment when Ilyich is speaking Lenin's words. He hits her. She turns to him. And this is not Lenin anymore. It's Stalin. Pure violence. I cut Stalin in at the place where you expect to see Ilyich. And for me, this is like when children discover that this is not grandma, but the wolf. In the 60s and 70s, Makaveyev was an advocate of liberation, especially sexual liberation. But he also warned of the violence that could be unleashed when the self-repressive character armor, to use Reich's term, breaks down, 
or in political terms, when idealism gives way to the urge for domination. It was a salutary warning in the context of that utopian dream of world revolution so many on the left were indulging. He was looking one step ahead. Myself, I never took seriously that any sort of liberation was on the horizon. If I found myself marching on the left, it was because it was the only logical place for a person with my upbringing and moral sensibility. Dushan placed great emphasis in that interview on the innovative editing techniques he was using for WR. I asked him, when you cut from the phallus to Stalin, it's like a return to the Eisenstein montage that's gone out of film for a long time. And he bristled, explaining that he too was dissatisfied with Eisenstein's dialectical montage, but he was trying for a more symphonic effect where a shot might resonate with one that had occurred a half hour before rather than always the one just before. He said, okay, with dialectical, with dialectical montage, they never thought about the montage and distance because when you pull together something from here and something from there in the same manner, then you have people recalling. You have not only a kind of one plus one equals two, but you have two plus two equals five. <laughs> if you take very distant things that have something in common, so people can be shocked at it and say, impossible, for example, the phallus and Stalin. <laughs> there is an enormous, tremendous power in Stalin, and this is the same power that is the sexual power of the male member. So there is the same power, and this is just to show them together, and in my opinion, the power of powerful political personalities is the power of symbolic phalluses or frozen phalluses, not real ones. <laughs> Machiavelli's placement of Stalin next to the frozen phallus was, when all is said and done, a fairly cheap shot. <laughs> Here we see Machiavelli's dichotomy, the intellectually sophisticated cosmopolitan and the somewhat crude, vulgar provincial operating in the same space. He then went on to say that each time you view the film, the connections change, saying, I developed this idea of shifting gestalts. In one scene, you see one connection. The second time, you see the film differently because now you know some things. At this point, I, the sympathetic and for the most part subservient interviewer, asked skeptically, but how does this shifting gestalt differ from seeing any other film a second time? He responded with a complicated answer about overlapping shapes, hypnagogic images, borderline experiences between sleeping and waking, and so on. <laughs> the ex-student of psychology, which he was, was unloading the whole theory of perception on me. Still, I was not convinced, because frankly, what had moved me about W.R., and I was very moved, very excited by the film, were not these A plus B shock juxtapositions, but its romantic, lyrical expressiveness, which emerged in moments like serenading the decapitated beloved with a Mayakovsky poem, and in the documentary parts about Wilhelm Reich's son and followers, a poignant tribute to a maligned, if deranged, psychologist who had tried to synthesize the link between sex and politics, as Makovev always hoped to do. It is odd that our first encounter consisted of my asking him questions, because subsequently the roles often reversed. In the getting to know each other phase of our friendship, he would ask me questions that came out of the blue like a European sociologist administering a questionnaire to a typical American. For instance, what magazines do you read? At that time, I barely read any except for the New York Review of Books. And when I told him that, he sounded incredulous, disappointed. You don't read Esquire, Playboy? Come on. <laughs> he thought I was putting on airs, pretending to be a European intellectual, not admitting to my American animal nature. Similarly, he would try to get me to spill my carnal fantasies, to talk dirty, man to man. <laughs> I have noticed with a lot of Eastern European intellectuals, regardless of how brainy they are, like Zizek, they bond in this stereotypical male way. Dushan liked talking about fucking a lot. He was obviously very interested in sex as an indicator of character, and I was as interested in having sex as the next man, <laughs> but did not enjoy talking about it as openly. 
Or he would ask me what I thought of some comic strip like Beetle Bailey <laughs> or Mad Magazine. I had virtually no interest in pop culture at the time. It sounds odious to put it like that, but one can only be interested in so many things at a time. <laughs> and my interests, various as they were, did not extend to rock music, comic strips, best-selling novels, and other pop phenomena. The one area in which I tried to keep up with popular taste was movies, since, like most cinephiles, I had a taste for the cheesy. But even then, I never saw any of the Star Wars movies or E.T. It wasn't a matter of principle, but because I didn't expect to get pleasure from them, pleasure of the heady, complex sort I craved, so why buy a ticket? Of course, I saw all of Machiavelli's movies, just as I did Bresson's, Fassbinder's, Tarkovsky's, and later Ho Xiao Shen's and Kiristami's. Machiavelli rarely brought up, he rarely brought up other filmmakers in conversation. He was not one of those variety, gross-checking, showbiz-obsessed film people. Underneath, he was an intellectual, trained in psychology and cultural criticism. His conversation ranged far and wide, from literature to paintings to science. One time, Duchamp began telling me about this incredible book, <laughs> Memories of My Nervous Illness by Daniel Paul Schreiber, who had suffered at the hands of a brutal father, then grown up to become an upstanding judge, then suffered a psychotic break in which he heard voices and saw himself as a man-woman, and managed to write an account of his schizophrenia, which Freud and others cherished. I couldn't quite make out why this book mattered so much to Dushan. Years later, I stumbled across Schreiber's memoir, read it, and sure enough, it was incredible. I never knew where Duchamp's latest enthusiasm would land next. Reich, Tesla, Schreiber, Mickey Mouse. But I kept listening, half dubious, half learning. In a sense, Makhavev was a collagist, like his spiritual godfather, Godard, who put together the day's dialogues at the last moment from snippets on the car radio taking him to the studio, or books and magazines he happened to be leafing through. Makhavev laid himself open like a sounding board to vibrations in the air. This meant, on the positive side of opportunism, that he was a skilled bricoleur, turning to the, tuned to the zeitgeist, but on the negative side, that his movies from W.R. onward were condemned to a certain unevenness in which powerful, meaty bits would play side by side with frivolous ones. To take one example at random, the narrative subplot in Sweet Movie about a beauty, played by Carol Lohr, married to a Texas billionaire, is silly. It doesn't contribute anything to the movie. Of course, Makaveev meant it to be cartoonish. Then he had problems with Laurie on the set, and in the end, couldn't bring himself to jettison it. He was devoted to clashing tonalities, even if it meant using material that was intellectually beneath him. I am now approaching one of the key problems in our friendship, my judgments about his films, which were not always favorable. As a friend, I wanted him to be the best artist he could be, to achieve the greatness that I saw in him. I have made the same mistake with a number of filmmakers who became friends. Rudy Burkhardt, Warren Sonbert, Makarev, all of whom I kept pushing to do something different when they seemed to be stuck, repeating themselves at a lower level than what I had envisioned for them. A better friend would have embraced whatever it was they managed to do, knowing how difficult it is to accomplish anything in film. Perhaps I was living too vicariously through them. The filmmaker I had thought of becoming in college before giving up for writing was competing with them or trying to achieve cinematic expression secondhand. In any case, Makarev, I think, needed his friends to be supporters, not critics. We had talked from time to time about my writing a screenplay for him. It never came to anything largely because Dushan was his own screenwriter. He once offered me the chance to hang around the set and contribute ideas that might or might not turn up in the script. He said he had a few such people who were perfectly willing to feed him suggestions for the greater glory of contributing to a Machiavelli film. My ego would not accept this. I had no wish to be part of some other artist's entourage. In retrospect, it seems a perfectly generous offer, and I probably would have benefited from the experience. Though knowing me, I might well have ended up the naysayer trying to shoot down his most cockamamie notions, like the dour intellectual co-writer in Fellini's Eight and a Half, rather than what he needed, someone who would keep coming up with loony, uncensored ideas in a free-associating manner. 
Makaveyev once introduced me to his frequent collaborator, Branko Vucicevic, a wise old veteran, cross-eyed and egoless, as a good co-screenwriter should be. Vucicevic, who had worked on Love Affair, Innocence Unprotected, and Montenegro, was not awed by Makaveyev, but neither was he critical of him. A fellow Serbian, he was fond of Makaveyev's excesses. He had the proper attitude. So now we come to the question, what were my judgments of his films? I adored the first feature, Man is Not a Bird, and the second, Love Affair, the case of the missing switchboard operator. They had a rough, passionate, tender humanism combined with a formalistic playfulness that never strayed too far away from the main characters. They were obviously influenced by Godard, but in some ways were a correction of the Swiss master. Precisely because, as I have said, Makaveyev was this combination of sophisticated intellectual and slightly crude provincial, he was able in these Yugoslav movies to make a much warmer, more heartfelt, careening, passionate, zestful, and erotic film than Godard could. What had unified the bricolage elements in Godard's first pre-Maoist phase, besides the intelligence of his visual style, was an underlying melancholy. One might even call it a depressive melancholy. Makaveyev's collages were also unified by emotional tone, but it was a more robust sadness. I relished his third film, Innocence Unprotected, a melange of cinephilia, documentary, and narrative. With W.R., The Mysteries of the Organism, he had clearly broken new ground and made his most ambitious work, arguably his masterpiece. On the whole, I embraced it, but there were certain parts that seemed to me merely sensationalist or shallow journalistic, exploitative of the superficial aspects of America, like a pre-Borat. I missed the black and white, basso profundo, joyous fatalism of his first films. Part of the problem was, was that he was now an emigre filmmaker who had lost his grounding, Yugoslavia, and was in the process of becoming homeless. He went from being the greatest filmmaker of a small country to a traveling minstrel of world revolution. The movement itself was evaporating, while his homeland's very name was about to be wiped off the map. Just as Antonioni's blow up was a brisky point, suffered from a thinness of social context when he left Italy's safe confines and began roaming the globe, as did Tarkovsky's last two films made outside of Russia, so did Machiavelli's movies begin to exude that deoxygenated atmosphere of the tourist. While it is true that European directors had previously prospered when they came to America, they were then protected by the studio system and the template of Hollywood genre movies. When the studio system collapsed, auteurist emigre directors were expected to come up with something original each movie, and it became much harder for them to succeed. In Machiavelli's case, it was particularly hard because he had grown enamored of the transgressive and was caught between the need to keep transgressing by flaunting taboos and delivering movies commercial enough to stay in business. In his Yugoslavian phase, it had been sufficiently subversive to assert the importance of private life and to mock the patriotic groupspeak of the state. When he moved to the West, the ante was upped. Now he needed to show people literally eating shit as he did in Sweet Movie. I still admired the tragic comic audacity and poetry of that film, but the very notion of the transgressive no longer held much appeal for me. It had started to seem mechanical, regardless of who was doing it, even more so because it had become academically de rigueur. Not surprisingly, Duchamp found it difficult to secure funding after the provocations of Sweet Movie. One time he called me when he was staying in the Chateau Marmont in Los Angeles, waiting for studio executives and producers who had previously told him what a genius he was to return his phone calls. He was in that nowhere land, so familiar to those hoping to get a film project green-lighted. Duchamp had wanted to make the first serious film with sex in it. Never mind Last Tango in Paris, this one would really do it right. <laughs> he came up with a screenplay about a white woman and a black man stuck in an elevator for 10 hours, and their progression from mutual suspicion to hot passion. The actress he had in mind for it was Sarah Miles. The man would be played by the ex-football star Jim Brown. <laughs> Brown, it turned out, had a scheduling conflict. <laughs> but the agent offered to replace him with Imam, the beautiful black model who was available and looking to break into movies. 
On the basis of this whimsical casting switch, the transgressive element would suddenly go from explicit interracial heterosexual to explicit interracial lesbian sex story. Machiavelli was still tempted, but the financing fell through. <laughs> Splitting his time between Paris and Belgrade, Dushan told me, when I was making film in Yugoslavia, I was toast to Paris. All critics loved me. I was everybody's darling. Then I moved to Paris and I become just another French filmmaker scratching for same subsidy money like everyone else. Incredible. <laughs> in the meantime, he, he began making a living as a guest professor at Harvard, NYU, and elsewhere. Pedagogy was an interest we both shared. Dushan seemed a natural teacher given his abundant energy, sympathy for the young, and overflowing ideas. When my own book about teaching creative writing in an inner city school, Being with Children, came out in 1975, Dushan actually read it, unlike most of my other newfound film festival circuit friends. <laughs> he made a point of telling me more than once that what he liked the most about it were the children's stories and poems in the appendix. The comment wounded me. <laughs> I liked the children's writing also, had even championed it but could not help feeling that my 400-page account was not chopped liver either. <laughs> to me, Dushan's response showed a cliched counterculture preference for the boldly primitive voices of children over reasoned and reflective adult voice. You could also say that as friends, we were each trying to reshape the other into our image, just as I wanted Dushan to give up some of what seemed to me his sophomorically orgiastic transgressive shtick so he wanted to push me out of my measured, rational mode and get me to write from a more elemental place, one that was more in contact with the unconscious. In 1976, he delivered the aforementioned paper, Nikola Tesla, Radiated a Blue Light, for a conference on the United States and the world at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., which was occasioned by America's 200th anniversary. It was a brilliantly funny piece of writing, holding in colloidal suspension Makhovev's knowingness and ironic naivete, his enthusiasm for American freedom and critique of American optimism from the perspective of one raised half a world away in a much more limited set of possibilities. Short paragraph fra fragments like this one followed each other with surrealist deadpan, and I quote, I like instant coffee and instant soup. When instant death was introduced in 1945, <laughs> as applied to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I caught myself a 13-year-old boy in a dilemma. I liked it very much, although I knew it wasn't nice that I liked it. Then everybody got instant excuse. Instant death had brought instant end of war. Instant beginning and instant end. Fast to pick up on the theme of globalization, Makovev seemed to be embracing the U.S. as his next inevitable subject matter. To my way of thinking, he did this more successfully on the page than on the big screen. He could control the ironies better. He also started putting together a reel of Coca-Cola ads to make some McLuhan-esque point about consumerism and globalization. These ad clips were also supposed to provide a leitmotif for his movie The Coca-Cola Kid. But when the film came to be shot in Australia in 1985, the ads fell by the wayside. The Coca-Cola Kid was pleasant, light, and forgettable. The dark side of Makovev, which had resurfaced in, in Montenegro, had gone into remission. He had misplaced his energizing Slavic melancholy, either via commercial compromise or the slow accretion of contentment. In 1988, I was appointed to the New York Film Festival Selection Committee. There were five of us, Richard Pena, Wendy Keyes, David Sterrett, Carrie Rickey, and myself, and we went as a group that May to Cannes to scout films for our own festival. Often we scattered along individual paths to cover more movies, but in the case of an especially promising candidate, we would all show up at the same screening. Such was the case with Manifesto, directed by Dushan Makovev, a filmmaker we all respected and were fond of. We were each rooting for him to make a comeback, and nothing would have pleased us more than to be able to showcase his newest work in the next New York Film Festival. Unfortunately, none of us liked the film. With Manifesto, Makovev seemed to be trying for a comic romp, a light farce, a fable set in the period of anarchist bombs and middle Europa naughtiness, but it came out heavy-handed and forced. 
Makaveev had sacrificed his natural grit by doing a costume picture, and he did not have the Ophuls touch of graceful elegance to pull it off. It was just not strong enough, we felt. And as we discussed our options over dinner in Khan that night to occupy one of the 25 slots open at the film festival, a larger festival could have absorbed it easily. Who was going to tell him? We all knew Dushan, but rather than pick straws, the consensus was that, since I was his closest friend in the group, it had to be me. <laughs> I wish now I had resisted this logic forcefully. If the decision had come from Richard Pena, the festival's director, it might have cushioned the blow with bureaucratic impersonality and seemed less like a friend's betrayal. But a part of me took pride in being the one chosen as the group's messenger. And that part even bought into the proposition that it would be cowardly of me to let anyone else do the notifying. So I left the restaurant to seek out Dushan in the cafe where I knew he was having dinner and waiting for our decision. I signaled him to come outside to leave his dinner companions. We were not going to take his film, I told him right away. Dushan was visibly hurt, stung. If memory serves, he even fell backwards a step. Of course, every artist worth his salt faces setbacks such as this and must learn to be prepared for them. Dushan took it overall in a subdued, manly way, but he could not forbear adding that without a New York Film Festival selection, the picture might not even get distributed in the United States or it might have such a tiny distribution as to be invisible, which is in fact what happened. He said, all right, you didn't like the film. I won't try to argue you out of your opinion. But when you think a filmmaker is good, you should support him. You should show his films, even his minor works. I am paraphrasing from a quarter century ago, but the gist I know is correct. The memory is too fresh to doubt. He reiterated the point that the New York Film Festival had supported him in the past. He had counted on us. He had thought we were his friends, and now this rejection. I could see his argument. I wished I could go along with it. But the only way for me to serve on the New York Film Festival Selection Committee with integrity was to vote for or against films on the basis of what I actually thought about them. No politique des auteurs, no outside friendships, no previous record should matter. I distinctly recall being pretty much an auteurist myself, thinking before I was ever put on the committee that my predecessors must have been idiots to have turned down the latest picture by some distinguished director. Then, sacrilege of sacrileges, once I began serving, I found myself voting on different occasions against a Ghadar, a Sajajat Ray, a Chantal Ackerman, a Zanussi, a Ruiz, a Makaveev, a Fellini, because I couldn't work up enthusiasm for that particular picture of theirs. None of which changed my feeling awful at that moment that I was hurting Dushan. He was so transparently expressive, his emotions so on the surface for all his stoicism that he seemed more vulnerable than wolf-like. Eventually the conversation ended and I left him at the bistro, walking back to the restaurant where my fellow committee members were having their after-dinner coffee. It remains one of my most painful memories. I still feel ashamed not that I voted against Manifesto, but that I allowed myself to be the bearer of bad tidings, the instrument that would wound him in this way. That Duchamp did not hold it entirely against me may be seen by the fact that he called me the next time he was in New York, and we went to the latest David Cronenberg, Dead Ringers, which had just opened. He was jet-lagged, tired, I was not, but we both saw eye to eye, a disappointing film, more interesting in concept than in execution. Dushan's taste in movies and mine usually coincided. Since that time, we have seen less and less of each other. We would occasionally talk on the phone. Once I called Tom Luddy in California and he said, I have Dushan Makaveev on the other line. Do you want to speak to him? And we had an awkward three-way transcontinental chat. I do think the rejection of Manifesto left a scar. But the main reason our friendship dissolved was more mundane. We lived thousands of miles away and I drifted away from the film festival circuit to concentrate on my writing and teaching so that we were no longer thrown together by circumstance. It would have taken a continuous effort of will to stay in touch. The next time I saw him, Makaveev had developed scoliosis and his back curved dramatically. 
bent almost double, he seemed to be meeting you more than halfway, stooping courteously like an old nobleman. I asked him why he did not try to make a film about the Serbian-Bosnian War, which was then tearing apart his homeland. He said it was too disheartening. He couldn't find a way to be amused by it, to make it into his kind of cinematic story. That sounded right. In any case, he was more interested now in writing books than making movies. He mentioned having several book project projects for which he was researching and gathering materials. Dushan laughed as if to say, now we are both in the same arena. Thank you.